Good morning, everybody. I'm James Shore, and this is the Art of Agile Development Book Club. Today, we are discussing test-driven development, one of my very favorite techniques. Uh, and I'm happy to have Mike Hill and J.B. Rainsberger joining us. Um, Mike G. Pa Hill was an early adopter of extreme programming. He's a software development coach who works with software organizations around the world. He has a great video essay, uh, TDD and the Lump of Coding Fallacy, which is just a fantastic explanation of why TDD saves development time. You can find it on his website, gpahill.org. And he also shares a lot of great insights on Twitter under the handle at G. Pa Hill. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Got nice to be there. I see a lot of, uh, I actually see a lot of uh, familiar faces in the crowd already. That's great. Nice. Yeah, we we're having a great turnout today, and we we tend to have some really good uh, folks uh, joining us. So, um, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, JB Rainsberger, Joe Rainsberger helps companies deliver better results using lightweight approaches to software development. He often starts by sitting down with a programmer to build something, uh, but the ensuing conversations tend to turn quickly to matters of operations and difficult interactions among people as they do. Uh, he learned extreme programming directly from its pioneers and uses what he learns to help programmers write code with less stress. You can learn more about Joe at jbrains.ca, that's J-B-R-A-I-N-S dot C-A, and he has some great TDD training videos at tdd.training. Joe, welcome. Thanks very much, and uh, I just want to say how nice it is to have the two first winners of the Gordon Pask Award in the same place for the first time in a long time. It has been a long time, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it has. Yeah, this, this is going to be a fun session. I, I wish we had more than 45 minutes. Uh, to get us started, I'm going to read an excerpt from the Art of Agile Development. Uh, as a reminder, the second edition is out now in both ebook and print editions. Uh, you can get it from Amazon by visiting jamesshore.com slash s slash buy aoad2. And you can find excerpts and bonus material by visiting jamesshore.com slash s slash aoad2. Test-driven development. We produce high-quality code in small, verifiable steps. What programming, what programming languages really need is a DWIM instruction, the joke goes. Do what I mean, uh, not what I say. Programming is demanding. It requires perfection consistently for months and years of effort. At best, mistakes lead to code that won't compile. At worst, they lead to bugs that lie in wait and pounce at the moment that does the most damage. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were a way to make computers do what you mean? A technique so powerful, it virtually eliminates the need for debugging. There is such a technique. It's test-driven development, and it really works. Test-driven development, or TDD, is a rapid cycle of testing, coding, and refactoring. When adding a feature, you'll perform dozens of these cycles, implementing and refining the software in tiny steps until there is nothing left to add and nothing left to take away. Done well, TDD ensures that the code does exactly what you mean, not just what you say. When used properly, TDD also helps you improve your design, document your code for future programmers, enables uh, refactoring, and guards against future mistakes. Better yet, it's fun. You're always in control and you get this constant reinforcement that you're on the right track. TDD isn't perfect, of course. TDD helps programmers code what they intended to code, but it doesn't stop programmers from misunderstanding what they need to do. It helps improve documentation, refactoring, and design, but only if programmers work hard to do so. It also has a learning curve. It's difficult to add to legacy code bases, and it takes extra effort to apply that to code that involves the outside world, such as user interfaces, networking, and databases. Try it anyway. Though, although TDD benefits from the other Agile practices, it doesn't require them. You can use it with almost any code. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our first discussion prompt. Uh, Test-driven development works best when you take small steps. So what are your techniques for breaking work down into small pieces? And let's, uh, let's go ahead and start with Joe on this one. Well, so there's an old one that, um, not an old one, uh, a less well-known one that I've been writing about recently. Uh, if you've seen me write about the SAF squeeze, the general idea is essentially what would debugging look like if you use tests instead of a debugger? And originally when Kent Beck wrote about the SAF squeeze, his intention was to show you how to start with a failing test that was bigger and gradually make it a failing test, which was smaller and more focused. You were essentially discovering the micro test that you should have written before. Well, one thing that I've noticed in, especially with this volunteer project I've been working on for the past couple of months, 
is that it is actually a way to figure out which micro test to write next if you're not sure. So one of the ways that you can work in small steps is even if your mind feels muddled and you're not sure exactly which part of the design needs the next bit of behavior, you can just start with a big test, maybe an end-to-end -end test, and then use the SAF squeeze to figure out which micro test you should have written. And what's really been interesting about this, using it this way instead of to fix bugs, is that um, I don't have to know where the behavior should be added in the code before I get started. I, I get to skip that, that friction that happens when you think, I need the code to do something, but I don't know where. I don't, you know, if my mental model of the code's a bit fuzzy that day, I can just write any test that might be useful and then use the SAF squeeze to turn it into an ever smaller test until it becomes the micro test I wish I'd thought of. Hmm. And then I can use that to add behavior in, in incredibly small steps. That is a, that is a great technique. It's also one I don't, I don't use or haven't actually heard of before. So already I'm learning something. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Joe. Jipa, so what's your, what's your thoughts about this? I, um, I am a, a very heavy user of spikes. Hmm. I, I, I mean, when I say very heavy, I mean, often uh, one a day even. Um, and, um, you know, we invented that term spikes back then actually to, to get uh, uh, user stories that, that, that didn't produce code. We use that phrase. And so they were kind of long and big and they would be some time box thing where essentially the, the gist of it was answering a question. Yeah. And, and answer this question. That's all I want you to do. I don't want you to solve the problem. <laughs> I want you to answer the question. And, and we called those spikes. I use spikes much more aggressively at a much smaller scale nowadays. Um, and essentially, well, I mean, actually I did it in a video the other day, so I'll kind of recap it. Um, you know, I'm an old man. I've seen a lot of problems. And I've walked, you know what I mean? I've, I've, I've met a lot of problems in code. And so there are a lot of neighborhoods where I'm perfectly comfortable just going right on in. I don't care. It's not so much that I don't, it's not so much that I know the answer as that I know the neighborhood well enough to know that I'll get an answer if I just poke at it a little bit. But that only covers part of it. The other day I had to do some stuff with sockets in Java. I, I got to tell you, I haven't written socket code since C++ in like 1998. So I really, I'm like, I don't know. No big deal. I fired up a blank, uh, you know, my, my default, this is a Java FX program template. And I wrote not a test, but I did use JUnit to write it. Some random crap, <laughs> literally. Because when you're in a spike, there are no rules. There are zero rules. And that's the key. That's the key understanding that you have. Well, I say zero. That's not true. There's one rule. Can't keep the code. Hmm. And, and that's what I do. Um, a spike is a period of time where I go off road for a while. I completely throw out all my usual rules and understandings about what it is legitimate to do in code. And I just play with code. But that means that when I'm done with that off road period, and I go back on the road, I have to get rid of all of that stuff. Um, and, uh, um, and you know, of course, the noobs will ask, well, well then what's the point if you're not going to keep the code? Well, it isn't the code that I'm interested in. It's, it's, it's this. This is what I'm bringing in back off the road. And, and you know, I say this, but, but also realistically this. I'm bringing some confidence, right? I'm like, okay, I know. I know how a socket works. <laughs> I'll, I'll just roll a test around this bad boy. And now I'm ready to go back on the road. So I do an, an extraordinary amount of, sock, uh, of spikes. Usually a spike will be something like 40 minutes, occasionally a couple hours, depending upon just how much I don't know about what I'm doing. Um, and, uh, and that's my main technique. And these two techniques have one key thing in common, and that's you hit the nail on the head when you said confidence. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing about the spike is you know you're not going to keep it. You trust yourself to throw it away. So you can commit whatever crime is necessary to get to a useful answer. And then you get total absolution when you throw everything away. And now that I know where to start, I can start here. The SAF squeeze does exactly the same thing. It reduces the resistance to getting started. 
mm-hmm. because I just I don't need to find the a sensible micro test that adds behavior to exactly the right part of the system. I can just say the new behavior is going to be somewhere in this code. Let me write any failing test and then systematically break that down by inlining and pruning, inlining and pruning until I get to the micro test I should have thought of and would have thought of if my coffee had been stronger or if I got more sleep last night. Yeah. And what I really want is to, I want more than anything else to get rid of this feeling that folks probably in the audience have that TDD requires high discipline. I think TDD generates high discipline. I think it's a way that we learn high discipline. And what I like, techniques like spikes or the SAF squeeze reduce the resistance to saying, to knowing where to start. I don't need to know where to start. I can start and my habits will help me gradually figure out where I should have started. And in Mike's case, the spike is like, ah, now I know where I should have started. I can pretend I started here. I can pretend I already knew that. SAF squeeze does the same thing. Now I know which micro test I should have thought of. Let's just pretend I already thought of it and continue from here. Fantastic. Uh, Scott is back. So Scott, uh, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. You're coming through loud and clear. Yeah, good. Yeah, I have a question and it actually is. I had my hand up raised earlier, but it is related to the kind of the comments that were just made and the throwing away of some of the tests. So what is the long-term intention of the tests that you eventually write that prove that your code is working. We just had the discussion this morning in my organization, like is the intention that they get into some sort of a automated testing suite that get run on a regular basis? Should I be combining my micro tests with my colleagues' micro tests for some longer end-to-end testing that covers more of the application? Do they get thrown away once I prove that my code works never to be seen again? So how, how long lived are they and how should we be, be taking advantage of them for the long term, if at all? Yes, yes, and no. Yes, yes, and no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, how about and you uh, recap what those, what those yes, yes, and no's are for, for, for the rest of us, like, yeah. like me? Yeah, we keep, yeah, we keep, so yeah, yeah, we keep the tests. Yeah, I put my tests together with your tests. No, I don't necessarily throw them away when I'm confident that my code works. Sometimes I do, mostly I don't. Yeah, same. Now, it's not that I don't ever use my test kit to do stuff that isn't tests and then throw that, that stuff away. But if it's, a, if it's one of my satisfy myself that this code does what I wanted it to do tests, then that test is going to live really forever. Yeah. It, it sits side by side with my source code in the same repo and hopefully... We, we, you know, we, we developed the practice in our team of always running them before every push. And in my case, usually after every pull. Yeah, I, yeah, I, the, I, I, I would, I would add on to that, that I do, I do come back and refactor my tests. Uh, mm. Typically when I'm done with a module, I think I'm done with it. I'm going to refactor my tests, make sure that they are reading really cleanly, tell a story. Mm-hmm. And when I come back to a module, uh, for the first time in a couple of months, my first reaction is, oh my God, what kind of idiot wrote this code? And I will often go through and look at the tests and clean them up to make them more readable and, and tell the story better. Yeah. The, 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 um, just because we keep the tests forever doesn't mean that our, we publish our first drafts. Um, I don't know why programmers get the intention or get the idea that their first drafts are always awesome and need to stay forever. Um, People ask me routinely, how, you know, how long should I keep these tests? And the answer is you should keep them until you have a really, really good reason to throw them away, until they become an obstacle in the moment, until, uh, for example, they start failing and you realize, ah, uh, nobody has touched these tests in six months. The code has changed. Nobody has run them. Maybe it's better to throw them away and write them again rather than try to rehabilitate them. Yeah. But especially novices and advanced beginners, my, my advice is the same. Keep a test until you have a really, really, really good reason to let it go. And then when you do have that good reason, let it go. That's great advice. Uh, thanks very much for your comment, Scott. Uh, Sarah has something to say. Sarah, welcome. Yeah, um, I was just going to reply to the first question of, or the first prompt of, um, in terms of how, you know, the TDD to help break things down into smaller problems. Um, I, I, I follow an approach, I think that's 
similar to both of, uh, um, of what you've said, but I add to that. I, um, I do like the outer test. Like, so, you know, when you come to the, you're, you know what the, I do a very kind of outside in a, approach towards things. And I'll start with, um, with, and it's about get, getting to where you're saying, where you, you're not overwhelmed by like the bigness of, of the problem. But I'll start by basically taking whatever my, what we've defined as like acceptance criteria for um, a story or however we've said, you know, the thing needs to be. And I'll, I'll go through and write tests and then work through um, what does it take, what would it take to test this? Like, I know that this is my end state. So what is, what would it take to, for me to build objects that, that test this. And so I start with a lot of test doubles at the beginning of that process, because that's how I can create tests that would kind of build out what it is. And then I go back and replace the test doubles. And then because I've already built some of these outer tests, I know what it is that my next smaller thing needs to do. And it, and it really kind of gives me this process that is, okay, here's the next little thing I need to do. And, uh, and I, I continually feel like I, I can bite off a small thing. And I know I'm being directed through my tests um, what small thing is, is, is next. That's, that's fantastic. I love that we have already three different perspectives on this. And I actually have a fourth <laughs> perspective, which is not more similar to yours, Sarah, than, than I think to uh, Mike or Joe's, which is that I start out with, I'm going to call the interface and I don't, I don't care anything about what the code does. I just want to run the interface. That helps me figure out the interface. And then from there, it's just this repetitive sequence of what am I not doing yet that I still need to do and uh, building it out from there. Uh, I think we could spend the entire session on just this one topic, but I actually want to, to move us on to some others, except Joe has a comment first. So go ahead, Joe. I want, to emphasize, yeah, I want to emphasize how happy I am to hear uh, what Sarah's described, because that's a sign of somebody who is practicing TDD, practicing evolutionary design and thinking about what they want and need to do, as opposed to following someone else's rules about how to do it. Yeah. Because when we think about what we really want to do and how to solve our own problems with writing tests, with writing tests in small steps, then we develop these particular personal styles that I've really come to see as preferences their styles, their ways that we do things that seems to work well for our brains. And then we don't have to get bogged down in arguments about which is the one true way to do it, which is better, which is worse. They're just different. And I would love to have a chance to pair with Sarah for a couple of hours and compare approaches and see what would happen. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent on that. Yeah. Also hundred percent on that. In fact, I just would, would even say I, I bet, Joe, I bet you and I are the least rule set oriented programmers on the planet. No, I don't think either one of us believes in any, there is no right way. There is the way you get it done. And, and I'm always open to, to trying different things, <coughs> especially if I have a pair who's psyched. Yeah. When I have a pair who's psyched, I'm happy. I'm on for the Absolutely. ride. Let's go. <laughs> it's so great to work with somebody who's thinking so that you can, you can take a nap. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thanks very much, Sarah. I'm going to move us on to the next uh, discussion prompt. Um, and uh, speaking of rules and breaking the rules, uh, when, is it, when is it inappropriate to use TDD? Or rather, not inappropriate, but when do you not use TDD? Uh, Jipa, you already mentioned uh, you do a lot of spiking, and of course, the there are no rules with spikes, except you throw it away. Except I break that rule too. I check them in. I keep them in a spikes <laughs> folder for future reference. So um, <laughs> I, I, so I had to do this. This was for a lesson that I'm teaching. So I had to decide what to do. And I, I built a branch. Oh my oh. God. I was horrified. I never use branches. <laughs> so I had to spend like half an hour just figuring out how to do it. And then I pushed the spike piece by piece onto this branch. And the whole reason I was doing it was so that they could see just how crappy mm. what I'm talking about is. I wanted them to feel, you know, I didn't know the answer to this. I just made crap up. And I just, you know, it's got variables like X in it. <laughs> and, and it's just horrifying. But yeah, no, it gave me the creeps pushing that. You don't have to throw it away as long as you are content to throw it away. If you are content to throw it away at a moment's notice, it's as good as thrown away. 
Okay, good. Just don't cling to it, man. Yeah. So, so when, when, uh, what other times do you find it useful to not use TDD? I don't TDD. I, I do a lot of desktop work and, uh, mm-hmm. And a lot of that work, you know, I've got a UI here. I've got, a, uh, in my case, it's usually, I'm working in Kotlin, but it's usually Java FX. And in, in that world, I do not TDD those UI elements really at all. Um, Java FX has a very, uh, it's not straightforward, but it, it, it's a pretty rigorous commitment to everything in the UI is driven by an observable of some kind. So what I do is I have, I have a view and I have a model. The model is rigorously TDD. <laughs> the view, I run the program and I look at it. Yeah. I, I think you're, you're uh, not the only one on that. How about yeah. you, Joe? Well, so there's the, um, I guess it depends on what you mean by TDD because there's TDD and then there's TDD. Um, and what I mean is that ultimately TDD you can think of it either as writing the test first plus refactoring, or you can think of it as a relentlessly iterative and incremental guided evolution of the design of the system. So now, which TDD do you mean? If you mean the you know, test first programming plus refactoring, then yeah, if I'm going to throw it away in a few hours, I don't bother test driving it. If, I'm, if I don't ever need to change it again, I don't bother test driving it. Um, if I'm really sure that the cost of test driving it is greater than the cost, then the benefit I'm going to get from using it, then I don't bother test driving it. Um, but if you think of TDD as incrementally guiding the evolution of a software system by some kind of tests, then what GPAW is talking about is TDD in the strictest sense, in the most philosophical sense. If it's incrementally trying it and looking at it, trying it and looking at it, trying it and looking at it. I mean, all you're doing is TDD with manual inspection because that's the cheapest form of testing you can do at the moment. Uh, I, you know, if you want an example of this, uh, I'm pretty sure it's still kicking around YouTube. Uh, Kent Beck did a nice little video about uh, cobbling together a testing library in CoffeeScript, which gives you a period, an, an idea of how old the video is. Um, and what he did, I would call what he did TDD from the very beginning, even though he didn't have automated micro tests to drive all the work. I think, I think the point you're making here, I'm actually going to move us on to the next prompt because I think it's going to be a really interesting one. But I think the point you're making here is a, uh, is a really good one because people often have trouble getting started with TDD. But you know what, what you're talking about, the do a small thing, check to see if it worked, do this. That's something that I think senior developers just naturally gravitate to. Mm-hmm. So all you got to do is figure out how to write that down and not yeah, do and it. If you're, if you're writing the test only in your head, but you have it in mind before you try it, then as far as I'm concerned, you're doing test first. You just didn't type the test in the computer. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's go into the next discussion prompt because this, this is a big one. And I know it's one that uh, people often struggle with and we're already, I mean, I wish I could just extend this for another hour, but um, uh, so the, the question is, is slow and flaky tests, right? This is the, the bane of our existence. This plagues us all. Um, what do you do to keep your tests running smooth and free of those non-deterministic errors? And uh, let's start with GPA on this one. I, what do I do? Well, I worry about it. So that's one thing, right? <laughs> that is, I, I actually attend to it. I had a case the other day where a test was taking 600 milliseconds and I'm like, yeah, no, I don't play that. And there's something wrong here. We don't, I don't run a micro test that takes 600 milliseconds. That's a hundred of those. I'm sitting there like this. And the more I sit like this, the less I run the tests and the less I run the tests, the more trouble I get into. So obsess over it. That's one aspect. Second one, in terms of actual technique, probably my biggest, uh, uh, my biggest focus is on um, drawing the lines between things in such a fashion that I can pass data and receive results. Mm. Because if I can do that, then... I can get my test down narrow where it isn't even, it's not a test double. It's, it's the array that you were going to get from this other part. I'll just declare the array and pass it to you instead of calling the other part. Right. So it's, 
it's it's how you draw the lines between things that that controls us. And I am willing to bet a considerable sum of money that Joe can say this in a much better way than I can. <laughs> Because he's already like blown me away like three times. We've been on it for 20 minutes. All right. I, I just want to say before you, before you chime in, Joe, what you're calling drawing the lines between components, GPA, I think, uh, I think you could also call that design. Yeah. And, and that's what TD is all about is driving your design, right? Yeah. Uh, certainly once you get past the beginning. Yes. So uh, yeah, um, a few things immediately come to my mind. So first, uh, first things first, being aware that it's a problem. Uh, and maybe problem is too strong, but being aware that it's a constraint. Slow tests is a constraint. And if it's a constraint, then you might eventually care about it. One thing I kind of want to emphasize is that um, I've been guilty of fetishizing this point uh, in the past. Um, uh, you know, I'm well known for integrated tests are a scam that kind of hits the nail on the head for this topic. Um, it's important to understand that that came out of practical problems that I was experiencing because I was in the situation that Hill is describing where I was waiting four minutes for tests to pass and I, our tests to run and I got bored. My mind wandered. So that's one of the key things. One of the key places to start is to keep in mind that this is not a theoretical consideration. This is a practical solution to a practical problem of if I don't get faster feedback, my tests are less valuable to me. In fact, if I'm waiting too long to get feedback from the tests, I'm wasting time doing testing at all. <gasps> um, so that's one important thing to keep in mind. All the stuff that I say next is going to sound like it's straight out of a university textbook, but it really isn't. It's all real practical stuff. Um, rather than try to do the whole thing now, I just want to um, point to a few. Uh, a few quick ideas that are worth looking at later. Gary Bernhardt has a wonderful talk called Boundaries. Just search on YouTube for Gary Bernhardt Boundaries, where he talks about functional core imperative shell. And what he describes in there are a bunch of strategies that are essentially all designed to do the same thing, which is to decouple what I call the happy zone from the horrible outside world. And my, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I do not have a video yet up about my universal architecture. I've been talking about this for about 10 years now. Um, the happy zone is the part of the code where everything runs in memory. All the tests are super fast and you can change anything at any time with impunity. And the horrible outside world is the stuff that James wrote about in the preamble to that chapter on TDD, the stuff that we get paid to connect our software to, but that causes us all our heartaches, like JavaFX. Um, and so I, my goal in life is to make my happy, is to expand my happy zone to take up as much of the system as it possibly can. And the primary weapon that I use to do that is moving details up the call stack. Mm -hmm. So if you search the web for JBrains, move details up the call stack, you'll find a few articles related to the dependency inversion principle, which I call the only part of solid worth using, um, <laughs> who's the, 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 the basic version is this. The things that make your test slow are the things that are the least interesting, like how to draw these widgets on the screen into pixels or how to store this data in a persistent data storage system like an SQL database. They're mere details. They're not important. If you push them up the call stack, if you make them the client, then it, it's what you leave behind is a bunch of code that just sends data from here to there, from this part of memory to that part of memory. All the tests are super fast. All the tests eventually are super easy to understand. And that's that functional core that Gary's talking about in that talk. And if you move details up the call stack, all the horrible outside world just kind of gets out of the way and leaves behind this wonderful sunny world in which everything runs in memory and the tests run at 5,000 per second and life is good. And see, that's what that's I was trying it. to say. <laughs> that's what I was trying to say before. Uh, Jay has a comment. Jay, welcome. Hi, good to see our wonderful guests here. Thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, I wanted to share a specific technique that I learned from Arlo Belshi about dealing with test flakiness. 
that he calls lose every race. Uh, the idea is if you, if you have a race condition and your tests are flaky because of it, it can be tempting to add a sleep to make the test pass. This is something that I've, I'll admit to having done in the past. Uh, the technique that we're talking about instead is put the sleep in the other part of the code. So instead of a test that occasionally fails, you end up with a test that always fails. And that forces the situation and lets you go um, you know, use your tests as support for addressing the underlying race. Uh, if the, the sleep is big enough, then you can that, that will help you know that you've actually addressed uh, the race condition and, and eliminated it. Anyway, that's, I think, much more of a practical, specific technique than what we've just been talking about. But I, I thought it's useful for addressing uh, certain kinds of flakiness. Yeah, yeah, that no, that's the, a good one. Yeah, and that's a technique that will tell you what detail needs to move up the call stack. And in this case, it's the fact that you're running something in a thread. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jay. Um, I I need to uh, plug my own stuff for a moment. I think because you all have been talking about uh, how do we make that. Ha I love this this idea of the happy core. How do we make it bigger? Uh, but so much of what we do these days is glue code that has no happy core at all. It is just sticky, ugly glue. Um, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today, but I do have this whole series of videos and material called testing without mocks, which is all about how do you deal with the glue code in a way that still runs at thousands per second and is, is pleasant to test. So I'm just going to put that out there and, um, move us on to our final discussion prompt, which is a uh, classicist versus mockist. This is oh, one good. of the big ones. Uh, the book sort of talks about a classicist approach. Um, but of course there's the mockist approach, uh, introduced by Steve Freeman and Nat Price. Uh, this is also known as uh, state-based or versus interaction-based testing. Uh, where do y'all fall on that? I know you're not really rules people, um, but which approach do you prefer? Why you prefer it? Uh, we got about oh, nine minutes left. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, let's start with you, Joe. Short version is, uh, I, I, I need both. I do both. I love both. And uh, I get very nervous when people talk about one as being superior to the other. Um, and even James, your, your um, without mock stuff isn't always without mocks. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but, but there is, so I wrote an article, um, I don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, maybe even just last year um, that finally summarized what I had to say about this, which is, you know, you don't hate mocks, you hate side effects. What I've really known as I've uh, become a little bit more serious in working in Elm and PureScript over the last few years is that um, method expectations, when you use verify, a search should have been called, what you're doing is checking a side effect. And, the pro and if you think you hate those, ex those expectations in your code, you don't. What's getting in the way is the side effect. And that's, again, part of what this functional core imperative shell idea drives us towards is the idea that if more of our code is side effect free, then we don't need method expectations. We don't need the mocks, James, that you're talking about. Um, and what I've noticed is that this is, again, a matter of style. The object-oriented style is very, um, very much about tell, don't ask, encapsulate by hiding behind, by hiding behind interfaces. And that leads us to a mockist way of thinking. And the functional programming approach is much more value oriented, small functions that return values where you can test them with the cert equals. And then you just compose those functions. And the composition is so straightforward that there's nothing to test. If you test the pieces, then when you put the pieces together, they'll just work. And then if you're working in a functional programming environment with types, then there's the old saying that if the types match, then the code will probably work. There are two ways of doing the same thing. There's a mechanical way to refactor between tell, don't ask and composing a bunch of functions that return values. And because there's a mechanical way to refactor between the two, you don't have to choose. If, you, if your native language is tell, don't ask, is the OO style of lots of delegating to interfaces, you can replace that with functions that return values with a mechanical refactoring that I can teach you in five minutes. And then you don't have to choose anymore. You can think one way. And if it turns out that that's leading to a bunch of mocks and you don't like them, then you can refactor the mocks away. And then we, don't, then we never have to have this question about 
mockist versus classicist again. There is no versus. Uh, so I know there's going to be a question in the chat. It's going to take you five minutes to teach this technique. Where do you have you written about that? And can people find it online? I haven't written about it in public yet. All right. If people uh, keep asking me, I will eventually do. <laughs> I see some folks waving their hands. Give me, give me. <laughs> yeah. It's actually, you know, I, I, in 15 seconds, I can tell you this. It's easier than you think you already know how to do it. You just don't, um, you just don't realize what you know. Thanks, Joe. Uh, what's your take on this, Jeepa? So the, I, think the, I think the most important aspect of my take is that, you know, there's... Steve and Nat are very old friends of mine. This is all intramurals. This is not varsity play. We're not... We, I, w use what is working for you. Yeah. What, if, if something is working for you, I think you should do it. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, right from the get go, you want to, you want to characterize the class and the, the classicist versus mockist as this is friends sitting around the bar talking trash. Yeah. The, the, you know, my way is better than your way, brother. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so that's the first part. Now, having said that, I hate mocks. I never use them. <laughs> no, you, you, really you, you hate expectations. You never use them. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I, what it is. So, so terminology wise, of course, the, the terminology here is vast and confusing mm -hmm. because you go out there on the, on the street and everybody says mock when they mean fake. Yeah. And, um, or, you know, when they mean, if you want to go back to Gerard's terminology, test yeah. double. Yes. Well, that, those aren't the same thing. Uh, uh, but, but, but I almost never, I don't care how you tell me the answer. When I call an object, I don't care how you figured it out. I care whether you figured it out or not. Yeah. And so I am very rarely, very rarely interested in any level of, of, uh, did you call you know, did you call Eddie? Did you call Bill? I'm like, yeah, no, I don't care who you called. I care whether you got me the answer or not. And, and I go that way. But again, I just want to stress, this is all intramurals. Yeah. You know, the thing, the thing that is hard, I think, especially for newcomers to either of these to understand is that when, when you're looking at, at somebody like Joe or somebody like Steve and, and watching their designs, and watching somebody go classist or watching me be very classicist and watching Steve be, you're looking at excellent designers. People who are excellent designers make excellent designs, whether they are using mocks or not. And it is very easy to think that the difference between my crummy design and this person's magnificent design is that they did or didn't use mocks. Yep. When in reality, it's that they're better at design. You can write poetry in English and you can write poetry in Arabic. Yep. And classicist is Arabic and mockist is English. Um, OOP is French and functional programming is Mandarin. It doesn't matter. They're just different ways of expressing the same idea. That for me is the key point. Uh, once, I once I saw that there's a mechanical way to refactor between the two tricks, then they're equivalent and it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, they're the same are, thing. These are great points. Um, Comper, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, has a comment. Uh, welcome. The question is this, would you consider it possible or likely to get a different design, whether you use one approach or the other? Oh, you're guaranteed. Or would you you're guaranteed to get a different design because the mock object approach encourages you to do tell, don't ask, OO style design. Lots of delegating. Mm -hmm. And the classicist approach, this is the thing that I didn't understand 20 years ago. The classicist approach encourages you to write a bunch of tiny self-contained pieces that communicate by returning values. And then the integrated tests are there because otherwise you're hoping you got the composition right. Whereas the 
mockist approach says we're going to test the composition as a first class concept. Mm -hmm. Would so you you're then given, to get different uh, design? Uh -huh. Given that we are going to end up with a different design, um, would you generally assume that one is better than um, the other for any value of better? Well, I mean, are we working in small talk? Then you probably want to do the OO approach, mm -hmm. right? Um, you're going to find it difficult to do the OO approach in pure script because pure script wants you to do composition of functions and use monads. Um, and that to me is kind of the primary difference. If I'm working in an OO environment, it's easier for me to do the more flexible tell, don't ask style. But if I'm working in a strictly structural, structured environment or a strictly functional environment, they shove you pretty violently towards composition of a bunch of little tiny functions. The class assist approach is probably going to help you there. You can still think in tell, don't ask. Mm -hmm. Then you have to do a little translation before you type the code into the computer, just the same way that I don't think in Swedish yet. I still have to think in English and translate to Swedish while I'm speaking. But that doesn't mean that Swedish is better than English or English is better than Swedish. It just means my English is better than my Swedish. And maybe my OO is better than my FP right now. I think this is a, a great point. I love, I love this yeah. idea that class assist and mock is really about the underlying design, really that you prefer, that, that works for your language. Uh, I wish we could spend more time on this. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Um, so I'm going to wrap up. I also have, for some reason, a bunch of jets flying by my house. So if you hear some noise in the background, I apologize about that. Uh, but uh, Joe and Mike, thank you very much for joining us today. This has been a blast. Again, I wish we could just keep on going for another hour. You are very welcome. And I got to say, I am looking at this screen full of faces and names. I know so many of you. Yeah, me too. And I just, it just warms my heart that y'all came out and hung out with us. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I'm really happy for the names I don't know. I hope those are yeah. names that I will know. Fantastic. Um, you can find more about Joe and jbrains.ca and tdd.training. And Mike is on Twitter at gpawhill uh, and on the web at gpawhill.org. That's G-E-E-P-A-W-H-I-L-L. -L. Uh, next week, we are moving back to the focusing zone with a discussion of customer involvement. It's all about feedback and requirements, a topic that we have wrestled with more than once on this show. So it should be a good session. That is going to be at 8 a.m. Pacific on April 8th. And I'm going to be starting this Discord, seeding the Discord conversation on Monday the 4th. You can join the Discord by visiting jameshore.com slash s slash aoad2 discord. And the following week, we're going to have Martin Fowler joining us to discuss refactoring. That's going to be April 15th. So uh, don't miss that. And we have some amazing guests lined up for future episodes. You can find all that information at jameshore.com slash s slash aoad2 book club. That is it for today. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. And I will see you all next time.